Thanks everybody for being here and uh, apologies for the mix up in the rooms. So if you weren't planning on an AI talk, then maybe you're in the wrong room. <laughs> you might need to go somewhere else. Um, my name's Josh and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, generative AI and sort of, you know, in the theme of Lord of the Rings, I'm from New Zealand, Wellington, is, uh, you know, is it sort of the one UI that will kind of rule them all? Um, bit about me, uh, I've been a part of the Drupal community since 2007, uh, joined Acquia in 2014, um, and uh, I've kind of really focused my career around working inside of that enterprise space of Drupal. So I've spent a lot of time with large organizations, they often have lots of different properties that manage data and get things, you know, move data in front of customers, content, that sort of thing. Uh, you've got a portfolio experience across international news and media, public sector, global sporting events and other major industries. So lots of different uh, spaces and industries where, where enterprises still have these large sets of, of data. And so you know, bear that in mind with what I'm talking about today. It is sort of thinking about the larger problem, but there's definitely some smaller scopes that this will apply to as well. So let's kick into it. Before we really start talking about AI, however, I wanted to just take a current look at the current state of the content user experience for a standard enterprise. So you know, today, digital, uh, you know, when customers go into and experience your brand, if you're a, the, the customer, um, you're often going to go across a number of different content silos inside that organization. So here's a list of some of those things. Um, you might you know, find the organization through a piece of thought leadership and a blog post. You might find your way to their website and learn about their products and solutions. You might get sign up to a newsletter or a webinar and start getting email marketing campaigns. There'll be at some point legal information, privacy information, that kind of thing. If you want to buy through them online, there's going to be an e-commerce platform. Um, you might need to also have some security information if, if you're compliant with certain, say, government standards or uh, things like GDPR. Um, then there's going to be other types of content, like how do I do this thing with your products? So you're going to need blog posts there. You might need some training, maybe a learning management system as well. There's going to be product documentation, reference manuals. There's going to be a support portal so that you can log tickets and ask for help that way. Um, and there'll be a knowledge base system as well, which uh, you know, has maybe a, a, some, some pre-canned ways of dealing with things to prevent support tickets. Um, and often organizations put something like a federated search layer that sits over the top of that so that, well, maybe I don't know which of those things I need, which types of content I want to get to, but if I can search for it, maybe the search results can help me get to where I want to go. I mean, that's kind of how Google functions when you think about it. Um, then you can sort of also say that the uh, content is a part of a different part of the customer journey. So at the beginning, I'm looking for evaluation. What products might exist to uh, help me deal with my problems? Then if I move into procurement, what sort of things will I need to know before I make this purchase? And then finally, I've made the purchase. How do I go about implementing that thing? And so these, these, this content actually has a different purpose depending on where that customer is inside that customer journey. Um, then finally, you have different parts of the organization responsible for managing and maintaining that. So they have sales and marketing that deal with content relating to evaluation and procurement and customer success who would have some sort of role in managing content to do with procurement and implementation. So this is a very loose uh, diagram, but it should reasonably translate between most organizations. They all have some components here and you know, the organizational structure will sort of dictate how the content's managed. But loosely speaking, this is sort of a, a rough idea of how the digital landscape works for most enterprises today. And there are three UX challenges with that current state that I really want to sort of talk about and address. Number one is that your internal governance equals your external experience. What I mean by that is, well, consider this, a, a, an organization has independent business units and they have independent budgets. And they buy and build solutions according to the remit that they have inside of that business unit. Uh, and so when they go and buy and they go to market and they buy a piece of management software, they really buy within what can that tool do for them and facilitate their business. And then the user experience becomes a byproduct of that purchasing decision. So we end up with lots of different silos of managed software and the customer has to jump from one management system to another management system and the user interface that that management system provides 
to be able to get a holistic user experience. So that's sort of problem number one. Headless, headless applications, I'll say, have kind of provided an option to get around this, right? Because you can create a headless front end and then have multiple you know, back ends to manage that content. However, that only really works if you have a business unit that focuses on a unified front end. It won't work if that business unit still is going to deliver within their remit, right? Because they're not going to create the holistic journey. Uh, challenge number two is creating an intuitive experience with Sprawl. It's kind of like a pointless statement. You can't, right? Like Sprawl is not a, a, a intentional design of user experience. Like who wants to send their user to another subdomain? Why is that a good idea, right? We just do that because we have lots of different properties that we need to manage. And the only way to really continue the user experience is to send them from you know, the flagship.com to the blog.com to the support desk.com or whatever that is. That's just a consequence of the sprawl. It's not really a, a user-centered or a UX-centered uh, design decision. The third challenge is getting to the fastest path from question to answer. Um, this is obviously the, the, the thing that we've always been chasing in the market when you think about it. Uh, and the fastest path to, uh, to get an answer today is always being search-based. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, that's why we have that federated search layer that sits over the top of it. It's why Google has been so successful in what it does. Um, but ultimately, it's not fast enough. People still end up mixed up inside of your content experience. They don't know how to find the content they want to get. And there's a lot of other reasons for that. You know, maybe we might not be really clear on where the content is. Does it sit in product documentation or is it in the knowledge base or is it inside the thought leadership blog post? Sometimes there's some real big discrepancies between those. Are we all practicing or singing from the same songbook? Because often different business units are producing different content. So how do we know that we're being consistent in our message? So those are the three the challenges. To kind of quickly review them, number one, internal governance is equal to the external experience. And the way we want to approach to solve that is to streamline the governance and workflow in, open, in an open publishing environment. I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Number two, that creating an intuitive experience with sprawl. The way that we can approach to solve that is to reduce the sprawl in the UI and optimize for the UX. So it's not about how many UIs you have, it's about what your user experience is. And number three, the fastest path from question to answer, the approach to solve that is through personalization, contextualization, and on-demand responses to questions, which traditionally is like the fastest way we've been able to do that is with things like you know, support tickets, and then a little bit faster with chatbots more recently. Um, and then of course, generative AI presents a new opportunity there as well. So let's talk a little bit about generative AI. Um, it, for those of you who don't know what that term means or have just heard of AI and not heard of the term generative AI, it's the thing that generates content, things like text, images, and video from a text prompt based on a statistical modeling uh, system that's trained from prepared data sets. And it's generated off a randomized seed. So it's really kind of important to understand the part that it's statistical model, not modeling. So, that means it's always going to predict what has always been. It's not in really like a, you know, a future predictor or anything like that. If you give it a new problem that has never statistically encountered before, then it's not going to really be able to give you an accurate answer, for example. So to give you an example of how generative AI works, you might give it a text prompt, something like, Dries by Tarot is a Driplicon. Give that to the generative AI. Voila. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I thought that too, but then I realized there's a spike right at the top of his head, so they, they kind of got on point there. All right, so addressing the three, X, the three UX challenges with generative AI. Um, so number one, we're going to make internal governance not equal to the external experience. So organizations can optimize internally for governance without compromising the external experience. That's going to be what we want to do. Uh, number two, we're going to remove the sprawl, access to that sprawl. So sprawl can still exist, might still have to be there, but it doesn't mean that our user experience has to be driven or delegated by it. So maybe we kind of constrain the access to that sprawl. Maybe we can surface it up under a unified UI. That's not something that organizations can just big bang, by the way. They have to work at it over time. As budget allows, as investment allows, you have to prioritize the things you're going to bring underneath that unified uh, UI. But we're going to want to make sure that uh, a goal is to have no cross-domain navigation. 
there, there's a lot of reasons for that, nothing to do with cookies or anything like that, but it just means consistent branding, easy to manage, and ideally one team that is responsible for that user, uh, user experience. Thirdly, the faster path to answer, Generative AI does the intent analysis, search, and response to, to inquiries, mitigating self-service search and content analysis, reducing the time looking for an answer. It's a huge mouthful. I'll try and go into a bit more detail about that in a moment. Um, but it also increases the availability of just-in-time learning. If you know anything about sort of the learning services or education space, this is sort of a holy grail, like can I get the information a person needs at the time that they need it? Google does a pretty good job of that today. Um, but generative AI really kind of takes it to a whole other level because it adds a wealth of, of, of context based on the question you're asking, not looking for a resource that kind of looks like what you're asking for. So to look at that diagram I showed you earlier, but with a generative AI idea plugged into it, it might look something like this, where we have a, a user experience, a headless-based UI with a chat prompt that sits inside that UI somewhere. And the headless UI plugs into a series of APIs that connect to all of those management portals that we were talking about earlier, but we're able to kind of bring that under that single veneer. Um, at the same time, we also have this generative AI plugged in and it actually sits on top of the federated search for reasons I'll go into a little bit later, but it helps find the right content that the chat prompt needs to be able to surface back up to that organization and ultimately helping to answer that question, whatever the question is, at whatever point in the customer journey they're in. You still have sales and marketing and customer service managing the content that sits in all those management silos, but you now have a new, new, a new UX unit and IT are going to help manage that middle layer because it's IT infrastructure. Um, so there are some challenges with this approach. And the biggest one that's really kind of hit right now is that generative AI can be too generic. If you've ever tried doing some testing with this, it won't take too long to realize it has these issues. So, it can't really respond well in organizational context. You know, for example, there's ambiguities in our language. So I might talk about something that in our, in our organization that the nomenclature means this, but to ChatGPT or whomever, it means something kind of different, more broad, more ambiguous. And so that can lead to misdirection and misinformation from the AI. Um, it also hallucinates. It can be very confident in telling you something that is actually quite incorrect and you know, tell your, your user to go do something like click in the top right hand button but the team product team have moved it to the left or it never was in the right in the first place. Um, finally, the, the, the third kind of issue here is machine learning. Um, machine learning actually requires really large data sets to do training off of. And you, it's not just the fact that you need to have the data, you need to have the data that is also with outcomes measured on it so that when you do the training, you can say, was the AI successful or not in the prediction? And if it wasn't, you need to give that feedback back to it so that it can continue to do that learning process. So you often need quite a high volume of data with quite a high volume of measurements that say whether it was a successful or, or negative outcome so you can do that training. There's a conundrum in that because chances are good that if you can get, say, a million sets of data that could do this, you've probably built some tooling that has done that prediction for you. So why do you need a large language model when you've already got the, 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 the business rules that would actually do this? To kind of give you a bit more of a, an illustration for this, so let's say you have a pool of data, we'll call that language data, but it, you can think of it as like domain data essentially. And you want to uh, turn that into a large language model, so you go through a machine learning process. So this would be, you know, I go look at, at a Twitter stream, or I look at uh, Wikipedia, or I look at a really large volume of data, I can sort of re refine it for some certain parameters, do some machine learning and get out that la large language model. Um, however, oh yeah, we will call that generative AI. However, a, a data organization is typically a lot smaller than those, than those sets of data that we built the large language model off of. So if we were to kind of go through that same process, it's going to maybe perhaps not be as, as comprehensive of a large language model, not to mention that there are compile times, delivery times, and there's sort of a state flow. So if I, uh, you know, it takes me, you say, a week to update my large language model, and then the content team publish a change, you know, they publish some more content, well, now it's not in the large language model. So there's a latency there that sort of is a, is a critical issue uh, in, you know, that, that you can't really resolve with neural networks that are hard-coded in that nature. So instead, we often do development and produce rules engines. By rules engines, I just mean things in the business that say, if this, then that. 
And if you have enough of them together, it actually resembles a smart capability. And we might call that an AI as well. In fact, in the market, many early uh, definitions of AI were not really machine learning. It was really just rules engines underneath the hood. Google might be a good example of that. Um, but we can actually pull both of these two things together and it's a, it's a new type of uh, AI, or well, maybe not necessarily new, or is as new as generative AI is, but this is the, um, an alternative way of not having to do the, the learning, but being able to, in real time, inject the information from your organization. That's called retrieval augmented generation, and it's a sub-capability of AI. So by being able to input the right inputs from your organization into an existing open large language model, you're able to create essentially an org level organizational capable uh, AI. Uh, and this addresses those AI challenges I mentioned earlier. Uh, so it has now that organizational context. So now that we have that context, we can make sure it's not gonna go talk about someone else's product or some other organization that has a similar name or it is existing in a different country or something like that. Um, it's also gonna be able to regenerate information based on the content that we retrieved and, and gave to the AI. So it really mitigates hallucinations because we can constrain the AI to talk about the things that are actually within our content domain. Um, thirdly, the RAG allows existing in, uh, rules engines, so things that we've already built inside of our organization, such as a search algorithm that would help determine the relevance of content based on questions asked by the end user as, a, as the resources to, to use to help generate that output back uh, to, to the customer. So same, same diagram I showed you before, but with this idea of RAG now plugged in, you can see all of these uh, digital ma management systems plugging up into a federated search system, tuning that so that it really get, does give you relative result, really relevant results with the query that you ask, producing those results up to the generative AI, and the generative AI then being able to respond based on, you know, accurately based on the question that your customer asked you. So let's review. Um, optimizing for the external experience. Uh, we can use Headless here to help unify the experience that just sort of helps with the branding aspects of things. It might also help with some other things like search indexing and availability. Um, trying to head towards a clickless answer from a first transaction for a chat prop prompt kind of objective. So this means you don't have to kind of navigate through uh, information architecture trees and menu systems getting across domains to try and find that information or even doing a federated search. It's just asking the question to the chat prompt and getting the right answer I have, irrespective of whether it's in my thought leadership blog or in a support ticket, knowledge base article, whatever. Um, secondly, we're going to optimize for internal governance. The AI is only going to be able to answer questions that you have content for. So do you have the answers for all of your customers' questions becomes the next immediate question because you'll start using the AI and you'll test it out and it won't answer things properly. And so you go, why did it do that? You go, oh, it's a content problem. We don't have content for that. We really do need to have content for that. And so we need to start optimizing for a faster content publishing system um, and a more effective one internally. And if we're taking away the, the, the UI for each of those management systems that previously held that responsibility, you really kind of need to double down on why are they still in the organization. So they really ought to provide some level of governance value and streamlined effectiveness in getting the content uh, out to the, up to the AI to, to do that, make that response. Uh, finally, we can integrate large, level, uh, large language models with org level algorithms. So this is the generative AI plus federated search uh, and creating that RAG based generative AI. Um, and greater content quality is going to e equal greater AI responses. So, you know, the, the content quality is still there, is that's not going to go away. In fact, you might need to have more of it, which means you're going to need a content management system, nudge, nudge, that will help you uh, keep a, manage a management of all of it. All right, so that's the, uh, how are we doing for time? We've got 10 minutes? Something like that? All right. So that's the, uh, the general premise of, um, of open AI, well, using AI in general as a, in a general context. And uh, this is a journey that we've been on at Acquia. Um, so my job at Acquia at the cur at currently is to sort of look at our current enterprise stack and um, sort of apply the same principles. So, you know, lo and behold, we have a very much, a very, you know, very, very similar kind of content problem. We've acquired a number of companies and over the years, and we've got a number of different places where content resides, and it's said in lots of different informations. 
Um, you know, and, and so we need to kind of improve this and make the experience a lot better and more intuitive. We need to do that across multiple products inside of our organization. So we've kind of decided to start with the customer experience side. Um, so sort of right now, not thinking too much about evaluation. In fact, the last sort of major phase of market um, business has really been focusing on marketing, right? Like a lot of businesses have been investing heavily in marketing capabilities. And so actually the digital experience for marketing it's pretty good at the moment, so we don't really need to touch that too much. So we're going to actually go look back to the customer uh, experience side of the equation and look to make that better first. So the way that we did is we started with our product documentation site. So Valentine's Day this year, we launched a new docs.acquia.com, um, and we are taking this, these sort of three steps in, in this direction. So that, that launch was, was phase one or the first step towards this direction. Um, so we're starting to consolidate our content. We have product documentation existing in multiple silos, so we're going to start migrating that all underneath a single uh, Drupal CMS, and we're having a headless front end powered by Next.js. Uh, the next thing we're doing is removing the barriers to publish content. So today uh, we had, well previously, we were actually publishing content through GitHub. So we were doing static site generation, um, and that was difficult because well, let me tell you because a couple of problems we had. We had, um, for one thing, if you wanted to be a content contributor to the doc site, you needed to have a GitHub account. And uh, you needed to be a part of the, the Acquia organization to be able to do that. Um, so for someone like an, a product manager who's got to manage, let's say, their product, uh, they weren't able to necessarily do that because they weren't technical folks to have GitHub accounts to do that. Even if you did have a GitHub account, like you know, you, you know, someone who's non-technical could do that, you still have to learn a markup language called RST, Restructured Text. Uh, and so that wasn't easy. And then if you did learn that, you'd have to go and do a, an edit in something called VS Code. And then if you could do that, you couldn't actually preview your change. Like, you know, unless you knew Git, so you could look at a revision. And then you'd have to learn Python to be able to compile the thing. So this, this was like not, not a good publishing system. It was for, for, for a time, but it, it, we'd definitely outgrown it by that stage. And so we decided to move it back to Drupal. We decided to use Next.js. We'd be able to use Next.js's preview mode. But one of the foundational things we decided was to, to use Jira. Like how many people don't like Jira? Right? <laughs> Everybody, well, not quite everyone, some people like it here. But um, Jira is uh, foundational to the organization, as it turns out. I think almost every team, doesn't matter whether you're in development or some other type of uh, fu business function, they use Jira for their process management. And so I wouldn't have to teach Drupal to everybody if I could, uh, and everybody already knew, knew Jira. I wasn't going to go and rebuild workflow functionality in Drupal since the workflow functionality in Jira was kind of superior. I mean, there, I, for example, I can, I can have a conversation called a comment. I can't do that if I'm, if I'm in a revision inside of Drupal. So we built some tight integration here. When I create a revision in Drupal, I automatically create a ticket in Jira. And that, that Jira that then kicks off a workflow. That means that we can get editorial review. If we need technical review, we can assign somebody to that. If we need legal review, we can assign somebody to that. And all of the links for that content change exist inside of that JIRA ticket. So if I'm a lawyer, for example, or our, our counsel, they can get assigned a ticket. They get an email notification from JIRA. It has the preview link inside it. They click it. Google SSO logs them in. They see the preview change, and they can approve it back on the ticket. The editor comes along, closes the ticket the change just publishes live in, in, in the site. So we really kind of removed the barriers from like not even being able to, to preview something because it was sitting inside of a GitHub pull request to now being able to like let the, the organization more like move more autonomously. Um, and that means that now with those barriers lowered, people are able to have more freedom in publishing. So someone could be inside of support the organization or in the product organization or wherever they are, they can see a problem with our product documentation. They can just go and make the change. They don't have to report it. And then it will just go through a workflow that will then result in the publishing of that change if that change was good enough. Um, thirdly, we uh, entered into some search optimization. So as I mentioned earlier, um, if we're going to put an AI layer on top of the search system, then the search really needs to find the resources that are going to help with the queries that you're sending to it. So that's a really important part. So we went through some performance improvements. We upgraded uh, search, and we also you know, had to re-index the new side and then follow that through into search tunings, which are still an ongoing journey. But all of this is sort of like foundational work that's going to help us 
move forward into that next era, era of being able to introduce uh, a generative AI to our customers. Uh, this is what the site looks like today. So I know this is a um, really small version, but you, know, you, can, you can open up your phones and go to docs.acquia.com. It's mobile responsive, the front page there, and there's an example of a, of a um, product page. Um, this is the Drupal backend, so you can see it's the Gin theme. Um, it's got on the uh, right-hand side there the uh, access to Jira tickets. So you can see that just below the revision log message, um, there's a Jira issues drop down. If there's an existing issue open, it'll let you select that. If there's no issue that's related to that node, it'll just say we'll create a new one for you. Um, we also use Tailwind CSS and CK editor styles inside of the WYSIWYG editor. Because we built with Tailwind on the front end and because Tailwind is also available from the CDN on the back end, I don't have to like pull in a CSS library from the front end to make my WYSIWYG editor look and feel like, like, it, what it, like it is in the front end because with Tailwind it just kind of works. So I just loaded it in from the CDN and there's no dependencies on Drupal to have access to the, to the front end site, which is really handy. Um, and no layout management is something worth kind of mentioning here. So even though it's a headless build, layout management something you know, in headless is definitely uh, something of interest for developers. But because we're a product, uh, a product documentation site and not a marketing site, the need to control layout is not really a requirement of what we're doing. There is obviously the desire to man, you know, control content as you're reading something in a flow of content, but it's not the same as like I need to have uh, a row of three cards here and like a row of four cards and a hero gallery. We don't have that sort of requirement, so it's not really kind of built in here. If it were, I think we'd just use CK Editor uh, and something called the um, embedded content, CK Editor embedded content module, which allows you to build sort of paragraph type um, widgets that you can embed through CK Editor instead of having to do that in a structured way. Um, and that turns out to be a pretty good uh, approach. It means from the React side, we're um, just having to deal with a blob of text, a blob of rendered HTML, and we put that through a parsing system. Um, and that parsing system allows us to adjust to any conventions we wanted to write inside of the content. Um, and we don't have to worry about like traversing, for example, a JSON structure of data and figuring out how to render it at each point along the way. We don't have to worry about any of those things. So it allows the CMS to be kind of concerned with those things more. Uh, we also have preview mode, so there's a yellow bar at the top of the, of the Next.js page here. I'm logged in, and now I can see uh, a revision. Uh, the revision will change. You see it's sort of orange. And then I've toggled the switch, and now it's showing me the diff, so I can see what changed between the old state and the new state. Um, and then I've also got this options drop-down button, so I've got an edit option to go back to the Drupal edit page, and I've got the discuss option, which will take me to the Jira ticket. To, hit, you know, to post comments or change, transition the workflow or, or whatever. So from a user experience standpoint, I can go you know, from preview to edit or preview to, um, to the JIRA ticket. And likewise with JIRA, we have the same thing. So we created three uh, fields, the preview URL field, the edit URL field, and the publish URL field. Publish URL field is our key. So we kind of look up JIRA and say, is there a, a node here by this URL that we kind of link things through? Um, and then we use the edit URL to get through to the, obviously to the CMS side, and then the preview URL, which uh, preview is initiated using the next Drupal uh, module integration. And so when preview is initiated through the Drupal CMS, but lands you on the, the, the front end site in a preview or draft mode, as it's called in next 14. Um, so we use that, and you also notice there's a, a field that might be hard to read, especially for the folks in the back. But there's a field called publishing acts actions, and it's set by default to cascade. What that means is you can um, kind of make a group of changes to a group of pages and sort of link them up as you can in Jira to things like epics or you know some relation, create issue links of some form, and then you can say um, close the parent ticket, and then there's a cascading effect that all the other tickets get closed, and that has a cascading effect of publishing all of the content inside of Drupal. So we can sort of bulk publish inside of Drupal as an as outcome of doing this through Jira as well. Um, and then, you know, there's, as I mentioned earlier before, there's a lot of different content teams that manage different types of content. So we're starting to map a different type of con uh, content type to a team, to a JIRA project, and then the underlying management system that, that runs that. And then thinking about how that can then surface up through the UI. And it's kind of of note to mention here that not all systems will use Drupal to manage their content. Although 
given the JIRA integration we have, it's sort of like a great foundational governance system. So now I can ask the question, why wouldn't we use Drupal? Because it has a superior governance system for publishing content for our organization. And so then we can actually open up multiple business units to use the common platform, which you know, executives are pretty happy about because then they don't have to spend their budget on it. All right. Um, so I know we kind of, how much time is it like, at time? We're over. Okay, we're over, all right. So I'm just gonna skip through. I had some like um, findings here that uh, we did a whole bunch of like uh, AI research last year. So I'll just share one thing here, which was um, we tested a GPT service to see if it could answer support questions that came to Acquia our support desk. So um, as an assistive tool for, uh, this, is a, this was the sort of executive findings, as an, exist, uh, an assistive tool for support engineers, uh, a direct uh, GPT tool could surface new and useful insights on Drupal related to support cases 40% of the time, likely reducing our response times as a support organization. Um, however, the competence of the GPT to answer support tickets would likely have a negative impact if we introduced it directly to customers uh, because it couldn't solve the issues 82% of the time. So it, we, you know, they kind of told us back then, they were like, oh, we, we still need support engineers. That's <laughs> yeah, some, good, some good job security there. Um, but there was, there was still a uh, much more needed need to kind of really leverage the AI tools down to something you know, more specific, organizationally specific. Um, I don't have time to kind of go through all of this stuff. So what I will do instead is just kind of leave you with these final uh, four takeaways. So is generative AI and the one UI to rule them all? Um, generative AI provides better information to users when it gets the context right. And that's really the key part. So, you know, one example, we did some testing, asked it, how do I you know, reset my password? Well, we happen to have multiple products and that process is different for each product. It's going to come back and tell you an answer every time, but actually they needed to have the, the product context before we could properly answer that question. Uh, generative AI augments existing content today, but does not replace them. So for a lot of companies who are looking to introduce AI in this way, it's gonna be in addition to what they already have, not something that replaces what they already have. Uh, user will adjust from 25 years of keyword search to asking for questions. We are a generation of people that use keywords to figure out what we wanna do on the internet. The next generation is not gonna be like that and we're gonna become more conversational with these AIs for sure. And one thing you can know for sure is that definitely coming in their roadmap is transactional features and chat prompts, the ability to improve uh, on that in the near future. So, uh, thank you very much for your time. I don't think I've got any time here for questions, but uh, come and find me later on. <laughs>